Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm actually really interested to stand here and talk to you about the Pauli case because so much has been said about it over the last two days, and quite frankly, most of it is wrong. Um, I, with all due respect to my friend and colleague, Mr. Sh Paul Chartrand, um, I think his analysis of what actually happened in, that, in the case is utterly wrong. And uh, I also disagree with what the other Chartrand here just had to say. Um, so I want to try and set the record straight about what really did happen at trial. Now, uh, Paul Chartrand had the advantage of publishing a book on this topic, which I have not done. Um, but uh, the reality is that what seems to happen is people have an impression uh, based on some I'd say a slight knowledge of what actually happened. And I think it's always dangerous uh, for academics to look only at the trial judgments and then make sweeping statements about what happened. Uh, because the, what's happened here is that, in, particularly in Paul Chartrand's book, he looks back to the literature about the Métis coming out of a 1981 conference in Chicago, primarily published in a book called Being and Becoming Métis, by, edited by Jackie Peterson. There is fine work in that book. And in fact, Jackie Peterson's article was heavily relied on by all sides at trial. However, almost all the material in that book stops in 1850. There is a presumption that somehow the Métis community just disappeared in Sault Ste. Marie in 1850, that either they all went on to the band lists or they all, mis all mysteriously all moved to Red River. Um, and so when we started doing the history for this tr trial, um, that was what we were all looking at, was that information. And quite frankly, it was a little troubling. We're sort of going, okay, well, so what is the history here? What happened after 1850? What, what's going on? We didn't know. Nobody had written about Sault Ste. Marie and that sort of Great Lakes environment after the marvelous work that Peterson and crew had done. So we set historians to do the work. And we set, in particular, Dr. Arthur Ray to the task. And we also set um, Victor Litwin, Dr. Victor Litwin, to the task. And the Crown set two specific people. Um, the first one, and of course my, name, my brain's going blank right now, but they fired her after she produced her first report because it was too favorable to the Métis. And so, but of course they'd already shared it with us as they were supposed to, and then they fired her. Um, and they got Gwen Jones in to do it. I'll remember her name later, the first woman. Uh, anyway, uh, what was quite remarkable about all of this historical evidence, which was what everybody did, was try to pick up from 1850 on, and not with any agenda in mind, but just what happened? What happened in that area after 1850? Where did the people go? Did they stay? Did they all become Indians? Did the Métis community survive? Did they all leave? What went down there? Because really, none of us knew. So we went, we, the three experts dug in, and they came up unanimously with a full record, and I mean unanimously, the Crown expert as well, at, and their previous expert who they fired, plus the two experts that I hired, all came up with the same conclusion. The Métis community changed after 1850, but it survived. Some people moved onto the reserves, and indeed, some people went further west because that was the way it worked in the the fur trade had basically run down the area there, and it was moving west. And Winnipeg then, Red River became the big center after that. So that's what happened. But the evidence was clear, uncontradicted, and voluminous. Boxes and boxes of documentary evidence, historical evidence, oral evidence, witnesses, witness after witness, everybody agreed with the same conclusion. There was no dissenting opinion on this. 
So the idea, and I want to say this is where I disagree with what Larry just said, the idea that the court didn't delve into what was a Métis community, what made that community Métis as opposed to Indian, why it was distinct is completely not factual. It was days of discussion at trial and debate among the experts, days. Now what the problem is is that most of you get to read two lines in the court judgment of the trial judge who encapsulates all of that evidence in a couple of lines. And the reason it's only a couple of lines is the evidence is because it was absolutely uncontrovertible. There was no questioning it from anybody. It was just fact. It was there. It was fact on the ground. And so it was easy to just say, okay, this is, everybody could identify it as a distinct community. Not, it didn't look and act and see itself nor was it seen by others as an Indian community, and it didn't look and act or see itself, or was it seen by others as a white or non-Aboriginal community. It was very clear, all the outside people, like German travelers coming through, writing about it and talking about it as a unique, distinct community. It was quite astonishing, the historical record. The other part of the historical record that was very astonishing were the incredible ties to Red River. And so I think one of the things that um, you know, when Harry was talking about the creation of, you know, the Métis National Council and the Native Council of Canada, there have always been people from northwestern Ontario who have identified as Métis. And if you remember, Harry told you that the organization was originally called the Ontario Métis and Non-Status Indian Association. And that's because they clearly saw two separate groups of people in the same way that they did on the prairies. It's the same thing going on there. And there's every logical reason for it. It's the beginnings of what's going on, what we see happening in Manitoba, and only 20 years later, 18, the events of 1870 were, um, they, were they began in, in Sault Ste. Marie in the 1840s. So that is one of the things I want to uh, clearly set down on the record. 